Ryan Miller, welcome to the podcast, bro. How do you feel a few days after your phenomenal victory at the Gorge 50K, your come from behind performance that we can't wait to talk about? <laughs> I'm sore, Dylan. I'm sore. I took it to the max out there uh, at the end. And I was talking with Tyler afterwards and him and Adam were saying how much they were cramping at the end. And I had some cramping going on in my left hamstring at the end too. So I don't know what it did to us, but we were all <laughs> feeling it towards the end of the race. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Aside from you three, I've heard from a few other people who suffered from some cramping. Maybe it's like just the early season rev of the engine that made people's muscles a little bit twitchy, but interesting because it was kind of cool and dry for the vast majority of the weekend. So I don't think it was like crazy dehydration, et cetera, but I think you guys were just on the rivet and having some, some fast yeah. racing and that's obviously going to punish, punish the legs. So, well, cool, man. Um, well, it's your first time on the show. And so I, you know, I feel like I'd love to sort of do a longer form deep dive into who you are and stuff, but maybe just to set the context for people who maybe heard your name for the first time over the weekend, just give a quick intro into to who you are, where you're from, things like that. Yeah. Uh, first off, I just want to say it's an honor to be on uh, the free show podcast. I've been an avid listener for a while and I didn't post my end of your Spotify uh, podcast and music stuff to social media like everybody else, but <laughs> definitely in the top five. So I've really enjoyed following along with your journey, uh, both, business wise, trail running wise, and then just everyone you bring on the show. So it's an honor. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, bro. Um, but uh, yeah, a little background on me. So I live in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I was born and raised here. I grew up, went to high school here, and then went to Texas A&M University, where I ran on the uh, track and field and cross country teams there. Had an awesome experience, um, and then immediately shifted my focus to the roads. I was more of a 5k, 10k guy mm. coming out of college. and um, you know, with my teammates, we always talked about making the Olympic marathon trials. So that was always a, a big dream of mine. Mm. And I managed to qualify twice, uh, in 2016 and 2020 before, uh, shifting my focus to the trails afterwards. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll talk a little about maybe why I did that. Um, because it was, I think it's been a really interesting transition these last couple of years to, having some success in my twenties. And then in my late twenties, when most marathoners would probably be really trying to hit that 210, um, yeah. when they're getting that elite level, I would shift to running ultras when I don't even, I never even ran trails at all before yeah. the last like year and a half, basically. Well, I mean, it was on full display, your road talent, what your PR in the marathon is like 214 or something like that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Crazy. So yeah, I think I said in the preview podcast for race weekend that you're the most talented pure runner in the field and that your challenge was going to be more of the technical terrain. You mentioned that you're from San Antonio, Texas, which I don't think offers the type of terrain that would adequately simulate what you confronted in the gorge last weekend. Talk a little bit about sort of the Texas trail culture, the terrain on which you train and, and what you did in the lead up to help set you up for what was a foreign environment. Yeah, th that is a very difficult part about trying to get prepared for uh, more mountainous ultras. And I say mountainous, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, anything with a sense or descents longer than a thousand feet. Mm -hmm. In Texas, especially here in South Texas, um, the longest I can really find is like a 250, 300 foot climb, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, getting up to 10, 12 percent. Uh, that's my max outdoors. So on, on the video, for those of you uh, who may or may not see this, there's a treadmill behind me and I'm really, I'm able to utilize that a lot for the climbing aspect of it, but the downhill stuff, Dylan, that's the hardest thing to get prepared yeah. for it. As you probably know, I mean, a lot of, I've seen professional ultra trail runners do training camps where they go to locations that can simulate the downhills of the race they're going to get to. Yep. And that's what I have to do. I have to go either out to West Texas where there are some mountains or the week before Gorge, I was on the Canyons 100K course, um, doing some work out there. Specific, like the climbs were great, but really just trying to work the downhills every day. Yeah, and I, f I think that actually helped me, even though it was only a week, a week and a half later um, at the Gorge, did help me on race day out there this past week. Yes, well, we'll talk about 
gorge or I'm sorry, we'll talk about canyons and we'll talk about the downhills and stuff like that coming up. But before we do, I want to kind of like start our conversation by going a little bit deeper and you posted on Instagram today, something that I think is valuable to talk about. And that I think a lot of people can relate to what you, I'm just going to go ahead and read your caption here as I sometimes do on the podcast. And what you said was gorge waterfalls, 50 K meant a lot to me on my coach, David Roche's SWAT podcast episode this week. He very accurately described my 2021 racing season as a shit stew <laughs> after winning the Bandera hundred K. Then you list DNS due to injury at the Tillamook burn 50 K DNF due to sickness at Western States DNS due to sickness at the JFK 50 and a DNF due to sickness at the 2022 Bandera hundred K with a couple mediocre results thrown in at the USATF half marathon trail championships and the Spartan us 50 K championships to boot Nike decided not to bring me back to the trail team at the end of the year. I knew changes had to be made. I revamped my daily diet and on the run fueling with the help of at on pace wellness, our guy here from Oregon, I sought accountability with my strength and mobility routine. And most importantly, I let go of the pressure of what I thought I had to be for myself and others. I internally accepted that I don't have to win. I'm sorry. I don't have to win the biggest races or have the most prestigious sponsors to consider myself successful. I'm loving what I'm doing and giving it my all. And that then I have already won. This isn't the end of some harrowing journey through hell. And this isn't the beginning of a personal renaissance. It is an undefined point on a lifelong roller coaster where I'm hooting and hollering with each up and down. And it's a long winded uh, way of introducing a question to you, Ryan. I think, you know, we can all relate to just having like tough years. And I don't think I delivered my reading uh, super powerfully there, but it resonated with me. I've definitely been there. I can relate having years where things just don't click. So maybe just reflect on some of the challenges that you list there in the IG caption. And I'd love to hear sort of like how and when you started to turn things around. Yeah. So I think anyone that probably feels success early on, uh, what mentality they start to carry with themselves, uh, for future, uh, athletics. I, and I'm thinking of sports as a whole, right? I'm thinking of the the tennis star in Australia that felt a lot of pressure as the number one player in the world in their teens. And then came back, had success and is retired again in her twenties. You, you remember her name, um, off the top of your head? I don't, um, a lot of people probably know who I'm talking about, but you know, my first ultra, my first, my second ever trail race, first race above a marathon. I won the Bandera 100K. Um, Golden which, take it race. Yeah, it was it was crazy for that to happen. Yeah. Um, and even my coach David afterwards was like, "You're like a year or two ahead of the timeline. I thought you'd you'd really be on. This is mm. great." Um, the you know double edged sword there was that now uh, I had uh, sponsors approaching me. I had Western States to get ready for one of the biggest stages in the world, especially in North America. Um, and I started to layer this pressure on top of my shoulders that like, you know, can I be the next Jim Walmsley? Can I compete against Tim Tollefson? Like yeah. a lot of these guys that have tons of experience and have a lot of proven results. And I still like, I, I want to leave it open-ended that I can be a great ultra trail runner, but I think doing that, to myself was unfair at the very beginning. Um, just not really having the experience to know what it takes to get to that level and to stay at that level. Uh, and I don't know how, if that really correlated with me getting sick or if that was something totally unrelated. Uh, David likes to theorize that I had COVID at some point. I had long COVID the whole year, which is mm. why my immune system was compromised. I have a one-year-old. So daycare would constantly bring sicknesses home and yeah, the timing of them was absolutely horrible with every single race I was trying to get ready for, for the whole year. Um, so I think layering all of that, um, it put me in a, you know, a tough mental and an emotional space. Um, especially towards the end of the year when I felt like I, number one, I let myself down. Um, I let a wife, my family and friends down who I thought had some expectations of me being the best, one of the best runners in the world or something. And then yeah. especially with Nike, informed me in January, uh, that they didn't want to bring me on for the rest for the next year. Um, you know, I felt like I, a lot of people had given up on me. Uh, yeah. It was, it was quite disappointing. And I, at that point I was like, look, 
what I've been doing has not been working clearly. Uh, I, I need to make some changes to my daily routine. Maybe not necessarily my training. My, my training was on point. I trusted David Roche with everything he was giving me. Yeah. But what can I do around that to make sure I'm number one, recovering properly. My immune system is feeling good. And so in the post, um, uh, Wilfredo or just Will who lives there in Portland. Yeah. Great guy. Um, really helped me analyze my daily diet and make some tweaks that have, I feel like boost, boosted my immune system. Uh, I started taking Can you be specific about that. I'd love to hear. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I, I did a dietary analysis with him where I gave him like a whole week's worth of everything I ate down to the gram. And, uh, I didn't particularly like doing that, but I, I knew it was necessary to actually get some feedback on what could I be improving here? And number one, uh, vitamin C deficiency, which sounds really weird. Like I don't, I haven't heard of that beyond like a sailors in the 1800s or something, you know, like having scurvy. scurvy. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I was thinking of too. I was like, well, I mean, it makes sense with the compromised immune system, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I wasn't eating a lot of fruit really. So now I have a whole stack of kiwis and oranges and, uh, all these, vitamin C rich foods that I'm trying to take in, you know, two to three times a day. And I Dude, feel like my mom, or I'm sorry, my mom, God, my brain is still just totally mud. <laughs> my wife made fresh, fresh, uh, squeezed grapefruit juice yesterday. We have oh, like so a, good. one of those fancy machines that we never use. And it was like <laughs> incredible, man. So the, uh, scurvy, uh, yeah, it keeps the scurvy away. Yeah. So, yeah. Keep, That's keep going. I'd love to continue to hear more about this. Definitely. Uh, I also started adding athletic greens or AG one. I forget yeah. what their main product is called. Just athletic greens these days. Mm-hmm. I added that to my morning routine. Um, and I, I felt a pretty quick boost in energy, um, from taking that. And I started implementing more protein after my runs. So I was, I have a recovery drink. I was taking that 10 grams of protein after all of my runs longer than an hour. And now I'm getting 20 to 30 grams of protein. Uh, after my runs, in addition to more carbs, I'm still trying to hit that three to one, four to one ratio. Yeah. And I feel like I'm bouncing back much quicker, which I'm sure again is wow. going back to the immune system, helping me stay strong and revitalized between my training runs. So I think over the last three months, that's made a pretty good difference. And there's still a ways to go. I mean, I'm not like a hundred percent. This is, I'm just going to keep crushing it. I think there's still some improvements to be made, but those were the big ones that I changed. You mentioned Dietary also the s- strength and mobility too. What have you adjusted there? Yeah, this one's really fun. So I lived in Midland, Texas, which is way out West oil country. Yeah. Um, I worked oil and gas coming out of college from Texas A&M. Um, I was a sourcing and procurement manager. So I did like project management, negotiated contracts, and I got relocated to Midland, which is probably the worst place you can be a distance runner. because there's, yeah. <laughs> there's nowhere to run. There's big trucks everywhere. Uh, but when I was out there, I had like zero friends when I moved out. Um, I was looking for some people to connect with and something just different to do. So I signed up for pure bar, uh, which some of y'all out there, I'm sure have heard of bar classes. It's a mixture of like Pilates and ballet and very, very probably 0.1% of the clientele are male. (laughs) Just putting it out there. And, uh, I felt incredibly strong when I was doing it consistently back in 2017 when I lived in Midland. So I had been pretty lax on it the last couple of years. uh, And I knew I wanted some accountability. So I was like, no better way than to actually have classes to show up to. And they're going to charge me five or 10 bucks if I don't show up. Yeah. So I started, I started doing that. And it is, while it is, um, you know, I would classify it as like high repetition, low, um, you know, it's not, it's not like I'm doing deadlifts, like yeah. 200 pounds or something. It is very demanding muscularly. Um, and specifically the endurance, some of the poses you're holding, you know, I may be in like a, you know, a one legged on my toes, um, eccentric loading of the quad type position for like two minutes straight. Wow. My legs are just sh- uncontrollably shaking, trying to hold that position compared to these strong women in the class. Um, and that was one of the changes I made. So I'm doing that like two or three times a week and I feel like that's making a big difference muscularly, um, in my trail runs. Actually. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. Well, yeah, I, again, I totally identify with having the 12 months from hell and going from 
feeling like you're on top of the world, punching your golden ticket at your first real ultra to then, you know, only eight months later, losing your contract and feeling like everybody's given up on you and everybody's forgotten about what you achieved straight out of the gate. And um, yeah, I think, of course, you mentioned your coach, David Roche, and how you totally trust every bit of training that he gives to you. And he had a lot of athletes out over the weekend and they all did really well in the races. And of course, he's a fantastic coach along with Megan Roche, uh, his wife and, and partner there over at Swap. And I'd love to hear, you know, of course, about the training that you guys were doing and you built your strength and mobility and your let's revamp your nu- nutrition around that foundation. So talk a little bit about the specific training that you and David were working on leading into Gorge. And I guess because we're going to get to it eventually, you mentioned that you were out on the Canyons 100K course, and I'm sure you were using Gorge as a great sort of test of fitness to launch towards that major goal that you're going to be tackling in just a few weeks. So maybe talk about the training and talk about how Gorge fit into the overall training architecture towards Canyons. Yeah. You know, Bandera really wasn't that long ago now that I I think about it. Three months, a little less than three months, actually. So not that far removed. And um, David would push back a lot when I told him I wanted to run canyons a week later. And he said, let's just give it one month and let's see how your body bounces back. So I think he didn't want me to set myself up for exactly what I'd been going through previously. Like yeah. his, his main goal for me. And this is the, this is the value of having, you know, a third party perspective. Um, and a coach, even though, you know, I could totally write my own training. It's not, I don't think that's the difficult part. It's the difficult part is balancing the, the person you're coaching, knowing their psyche, what their goals are, their motivations. And that's what David knows I'm, I'm driven in that way, but he also didn't want me to put myself in a position to injure myself, prolong what I've been feeling. Or to keep chasing and keep getting those same negative results. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think people I can't remember. I I think it might've been Tim when he came on your podcast kind of talking about after Western States, when he felt disappointed with his fifth place finish, like that was almost what was driving him to the UTMB start line when he kind of also realized he shouldn't, he shouldn't be there, you Mm -hmm. know? And now David was in a, in a way was helping me through that. Um, so we just took a really slow build over the next four weeks, you know, 30 miles, 50 miles, 60, 75, um, nothing too crazy. And just starting in, in some light fart, like workouts, um, light tempo workouts, almost something that would be traditional to base building for a half marathon or a marathon, mm. um, with some trail running mixed in, but nothing specific. And when that started going well, I signed up for a local trail marathon called the Goodwater trail marathon, uh, up in Georgetown, Texas. Uh, my family, we went camping up there. We made it a big family weekend. It really wasn't about the race. Uh, but I just wanted to see like, how's my body going to you know, react to like a harder long run type effort. And it went well, my body felt good. Um, I've been working with Wilfredo for a couple of weeks before that and had a good nutrition game plan for the race going into it. And I felt good, uh, for the first time in a while. And so I talked to David on the phone the next day and he's like, if you want to be in canyons, let's go to canyons. Um, so we, we walked out a game plan. Uh, looking for one tune-up race and then to do a training camp of some sort, uh, either on the Canyons course or somewhere else in the mountains, basically. Yep. And that's how things aligned leading up to Canyons. And when I heard that, you know, you were putting on Gorge and it was going to be back on, I'd seen the YouTube videos from uh, Ethan Newberry, the ginger runner, uh, yeah. Jim running it when he got his golden ticket. And I was like, that place just looks epic. Uh, and I initially signed up, I don't know if you remember for the hundred K yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know I was going to run canyons back then. Um, yeah. and I shifted back to the 50 K, um, you know, a little over a month ago or so. Yeah. And so that's how it lined up. I was really unsure how I'd feel, uh, this past weekend coming off my canyons training camp, which we can talk in more detail about, uh, cause I, I went pretty hard, uh, the week before, um, I think I put in a hundred 105 miles total, um, wow. you know, 20,000 feet of climbing, but it was 88 miles over four days with 18,000 feet. Nice. So that was, uh, I was pretty tired coming into the week and was unsure how, sure. how gorgeous might go. Huh? Wow. 
Well, thanks for that little glimpse into the training. And, you know, I think it's a great uh, illustration of the saying that there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's always people can take different approaches and have amazing success. And I want to talk about the race execution for you, because to me, it was like one of the stories of the weekend, right? Because it was a massive cumber from behind victory, I'm sure it felt phenomenal in retrospect to execute in the way that you did. You mentioned earlier that your Achilles heel has been on technical descents, living where you do in San Antonio and you lost contact, I think from the lead group on the one big long descent on the whole course. And then you and I saw each other on the road a short time later and you were very much in familiar territory. I think happy to be on the road there because you were freaking flying and, um, yeah. So maybe talk us through that, that early part of the course. And and then maybe like, if you were getting down on yourself psychologically, when you did lose contact with the leader so early in the race. It's a great question. Uh, and I love the, I, I had no idea there was going to be road or pavement on this course. I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, uh, beyond the waterfalls and some of, <laughs> some of the trails out there, uh, that I'd seen in the video. So when I saw the pavement, I was, uh, very happy that I knew I would be able to make up some time on those sections. But I crested that first big climb uh, with Tyler and with Adam, uh, Tyler Green and Adam Mary, and felt pretty good doing it. But as soon as it turned down, uh, I was able to hang on to Tyler for a good while. Adam just, you know, started really gapping us. And that's, I know that's his strength from chatting with him and running with him previously. Mm. Uh, and we were burning it hot there. Uh, I'll have to go back and look at the splits, but with how technical Rocky and a little bit wet, the trails were with some drizzle at the time, uh, we were moving and it was actually once we hit the bottom and started climbing back up and just getting into some of the rolling Hills that Tyler really gapped me. And then I couldn't see Adam after the descent, anyways. Um, mm. And I had no idea how far ahead they were. I, at that point I was running alone and in my head, I was thinking, okay, you know, you, you're in third, four, I was in fourth place at that point, actually, mm-hmm. you know, just run your race. You're out here to have a fun time. Number one. And I was having a fun time because the Good. trails were beautiful. And I was trying to be, um, have gratitude for the day and the ability to be out there and the weather. It was just, that was the funnest part of it. And if I catch them, if I don't, whatever it is, um, ultimately this is going to be a really, really good effort for canyons once I get some recovery mm. and afterwards. So uh, you, weren't, you weren't battling a like, oh no, this is now going sideways again. Like I had better ambitions in fourth place and I'm losing contact already. You were able to maintain the gratitude and the perspective of the greater goal that being canyons under K in a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I never had a negative mindset out there, uh, which was great because again, band air hundred K the weeks before I had a negative mindset at mile, like 10. Yeah. I was feeling crappy and had mud caked all over my shoes. I mean, uh, what a great, what a great example of how important the mind is, isn't it? Because it, ultimately it really <laughs> fast forwarding a little bit, you came back through, you came through the cascade locks aid station and second, this is roughly 20 miles into the race, but you were still like four or five minutes behind Tyler, which is a pretty substantial gap with roughly 10 miles to go in the race. So talk us through that section there, because then on the way back, I was filming Taylor Nowlin as she was making her way towards the turnaround point. And Tyler came past me and maybe 20 seconds later you came through and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is going to be a race. So yeah. Paint the picture for the, uh, the listeners about how those last 10 miles played out and how you were able to make up so much time. I remember when I passed you on the trail, you just go, wow. I remember you like <laughs> almost like whispered it in my ear right as I was passing. You. That was I wasn't that was expecting my- to see you so quick. I was like <laughs> looking at my watch to get a split, and before I knew it, you were on top of us. So. <laughs> that was that was funny. I'd actually been getting. Uh, my wife was my only crew member out there, and I asked her at each aid station I would see her to give me a amount of time I was down. So I believe probably max, I was down somewhere between four and six minutes. Uh, Some people were throwing out six minutes out there, which 
that's a lot. That would mean I was been down by almost a mile to those guys up front. Um, I don't know if it was actually that much though. It sounds more epic when you tell this story and you're down. I mean, I think it was, I think it was about four or five minutes at the Cascade Locks aid station. Yeah. Yeah. And I was still in third at that point. Actually, Adam was still ahead of me uh, there. I, I still didn't, I heard I was dead down two minutes when I went through that aid station. I was like, okay, I'm actually making up some time here. I think you were two minutes behind Adam who was two minutes. Oh, behind Adam. Adam. Okay. Yeah. I, they weren't telling me specific people or where anybody was. Anyway, it, it was like, to me, it was like, okay, Tyler's in control here. Mm-hmm. And then when I saw you again, whatever it was, maybe an hour later, you were breathing down his neck. So you had made up a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that climb coming out of the Cascade Locks aid station, I was just plugging away. I knew I was, I was making up time on whoever it was up there. And if I kept running like I was, I felt I didn't feel bad, you know, at about mile 12, I probably hit my lowest point and it just stayed steady throughout the day from there. And I actually felt a lot better, like the last five miles of the race when the adrenaline actually kicked in, as I think a lot of us have probably had at some point in races, whether it's, you know, in high school, cross country or road races or trail races where like, you are just flying, passing people at the end and you don't even feel the pain anymore. You're just mm-hmm. letting it rip. And that's, that's definitely how I felt at the end. But when I hit the turnaround, that was really the key point. Uh, I saw how close I was to Tyler and Adam. Um, at the turnaround, I grabbed the little chip, uh, which I never gave to you. I actually have it on my Keep desk Keep it, here. bro. Keep <laughs> it. That's a souvenir. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I carry that at canyons. That's what you need to do. Put that in your pocket at canyons. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Keep going. I want to hear this. Yeah. At the turnaround, Adam was like right there. I turned the corner and there's like a little, just a little lip going up to pick up the, the chip. And I, I was like 50 meters down from Adam. I was like, Holy crap. Like, all right, this I'm I'm definitely going to be picking up second here. Uh, I, when I passed him, I did the patented make your move with authority type deal and yeah. just took off sprinting down the hill just to try and make sure that, you know, no one could try and latch onto the back of me and just hold on. And then in my head, I'm thinking, okay, Tyler's coming up. Let's see how long it takes until I see him. Uh, at that point, I started seeing other people in the race too, which was really fun because everybody was cheering each other on like men, women, uh, you know, I was telling them good job and they were saying things like, wow, you know, like when you passed you, yeah. uh, and it was probably about a mile before the Cascade Locks aid station going through it again, which would have been what mile 28 or mm-hmm. so that I caught a glimpse of Tyler up ahead. And, you know, it was, he was probably 150, 200 meters up, uh, but I knew I'm coming up on him. Uh, it's probably gonna be a matter of time before I actually catch him. And I started thinking in my head, what, what am I actually going to do once I catch him? Cause I'm sure he was thinking too, when he saw me at the turnaround, how close I was starting to get and maybe formulating a game plan, plan in his head yeah. of what, how, what his reaction is going to be. And, you know, maybe if you talk to him after the race, I, I did. And he told me he was planning on like holding a little bit back and trying to move with me as soon as I, I caught up to him. Dude's a competitor. He really is. I mean, gosh, he just fights like no other. See him go through that finish line, uh, both there. And he did the same thing at Chuck and where he just collapsed and fell Dude. over. He gives it all. Yeah. That's for sure. So I think Zach was on the camera following Tyler on Instagram live. (laughs) He totally crashed into a tree. His phone went flying into the woods. (laughs) It was hilarious. And I got so many messages after the race. So let me back up a little bit, go through cascade locks. Uh, my wife wasn't there. My, my crew member, I, she was, she thought I was going to come in like five minutes later. Uh, Um, so she too was very surprised with how I'd been moving. And so if you look on the video, I'm looking around. I have my bottles in my hand. I don't see her. And I just throw the bottles over my head, knowing someone will pick them up and probably bring them to the finish line or throw them away or something. Yeah. Um, I promise I wasn't littering on the course. Yeah, just all good, man. <laughs> throw it down. And I was like, I had three miles to go. I don't need any nutrition. Yeah. Let's just hammer it home. I did hear her yell from the porta potty though. Like Ryan, as I was right when I was finishing <laughs> going through the aid station. Too late, babe. I'm off. <laughs> too, yeah. too late. Uh, and then I could, I could see... Tyler, you know, 20 seconds ahead, 15 seconds ahead, 10 seconds ahead and caught him maybe about a mile and a half out. It was maybe a quarter mile before we hit the pavement, um, for the final stretch. And that was the classic moment where Zach, I, he heard me coming up. He took a step off the trail, 
fell through his camera. Uh, and then I passed Tyler as I did the same thing with Tyler as I did with Adam, where I just, I tried to make a really push. hard push, yeah. uh, just to try and break that string immediately of connection there. Yeah. I bet and, he was thinking, Oh no, we're about to hit this bike path. This dude's going to drop <laughs> five fifteen miles on me. Well, dude, I mean, thanks for the, characterization of the whole thing. I mean, it was a great freaking performance coming from four or five minutes back with 10 miles to go it is a real closers performance there. And I'm sure it gives you a lot of confidence looking ahead, maybe quickly before we look ahead towards canyons and wrap up, talk about the feeling of elation or even relief that you probably felt after the last 12 months that you've had to cross the finish line in first place, running a crazy fast time fighting to the bitter end and coming home with a proud victory. Yeah. I think you put, you put the exact right word that I would have said, uh, relief, uh, excitement about what this means for the future. Uh, it shows that I'm on the right track. Uh, with what I'm doing with training and recovery and strength, just the whole program of trying to get ready to be, to run on an elite national and hopefully international level uh, coming up here. So it, it felt really good crossing the line. Um, it makes the soreness and the near hypothermia type symptoms after finishing and everything that you feel, you know, post ultra worth it for yeah. sure. Well, congratulations, man. So Thanks. looking ahead and as we wrap up, I'd love to hear maybe what you and David are talking about to the extent that you're willing to reveal it, looking ahead towards canyons where I'm sure the goal is to capture another golden ticket and earn your spot at Western States. The field is absolutely silly fast at canyons. Yeah. Like probably one of the most competitive races on North American soil outside of a Western States race of all time. So give us a glimpse into your psychology now looking ahead towards what is, I'm sure a, a huge goal of yours. Yeah, that's a good, a good question. Uh, you know, I think David is really happy with where my overall aerobic fitness is right now and running economy and some of the workouts I did, before uh gorge and the canyons training camp went awesome like i had like a 16 mile long run where i was doing like two minutes at you know five flat type pace and then doing a float at like 545 and just you know average 530 pace for 16 miles on some rolling terrain feeling great the whole time so wow. that was a good a good confidence builder that hey you know the fitness is good we just really need to tune in the trail specific skills and those downhills that we talked about earlier. Um, because, you know, I don't know if there's many people out there. Uh, I mean, Adam Peterman is going to be, it's going to be a hell of a debut for him. I'll just throw that out there. Yeah. Um, but beyond him, when I look through the starting list, if it's a pure fitness test, I think I have, I like, will be up there for the golden ticket, right? It's just the mm -hmm. other skill sets that I haven't been able to work on or don't have as it's much execution with. for you. Yeah. You're clearly fit. It's about execution here. Exactly. So that's, that's what David and I talked about. And that's what the goal of the Canyons training camp gorge was. And now we're almost entering like a three week taper because I'm just making sure I'm recovering this week. Um, and the goal is to get to the starting line of Canyons feeling fresh and energized for the race. Mm -hmm. So I'll put in a couple of, I think I have like, uh, 16 miles with some fart lake tomorrow, uh, 16 miles the next day. So a couple back-to-back -back long runs um, on the trails with, you know, some downhill focus. But not like crazy long runs, especially no, if you build up no. to 100K. So 16 miles will be the longest long run I do the rest of the way. Um, so it's really just a long uh, taper post-gorge to get there. And Hell I'm yeah. excited. I've seen the whole Canyons course. I know exactly what's coming my way. Um, I've done it both directions because I was – did a Western States training camp too yeah. before last year. And I, um, uh, Oh, one thing else we're implementing is some sauna training. So even though I do live in Texas, that Canaan's course will get hot. Uh, get I felt hot. it. I felt it out there in March. It was getting up into the, I think today area. it's supposed to be like 90 in the area. Yeah. So. Yeah. And in the canyons you could be touching on triple digits potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. 
Well, Ryan, congratulations, man. I mean, honestly, it was so inspiring to see you pull off that victory, especially because I, I knew deep down that like you were waiting for another good one. And, you know, even though Tyler's a good friend and the pride of Portland and, you know, he, of course he was very gracious and, uh, you know, defeat, it still brought home a really proud second place performance and he's already in at Western States. And I think this will be good for him too, to just sort of develop the racing mindset and things like that. And Adam also delivered an awesome third place performance, but I have to say, dude, it was, uh, it was really inspiring to see you execute in the way that you did being far back in the middle of the race and come through, um, for super fast, proud, perfectly well executed 50 mile win. So looking ahead to canyons, I just want to say good luck to you. I wish I could be there in person to witness the drama. It's going to be a phenomenal race. And, uh, you know, if you do indeed punch your ticket to Western States, I'll look forward to seeing you there. And, um, yeah, just look forward to connecting again in the future. For sure. I appreciate you having me on the podcast, Dylan. And thanks for everything you and the entire Daybreak and uh, Free Trail team, everything y'all did to put together gorgeous. I mean, it's going to be a race that everybody in the country is going to want to run over the next few years. And I know <laughs> oh, I'm yes. going to be back for sure. <laughs> You're always welcome. Thanks. Buddy. All right, bro. Get in the sauna. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Keely, you champion. How are you? It's a beautiful day here in Portland. How are you feeling a few days removed from another fantastic victory over the weekend? Hey, I'm feeling pretty good, actually. I've definitely been sleeping a lot more than I normally do, which I'm attributing to allergies because everything's blooming here in Portland, but maybe it's just because I'm tired because I ran a 50K after being out there crewing and cheering for everyone at the 100K. But uh, yeah, otherwise I feel really good. I just got back from mountain bike ride. And so Did really taking really? advantage of this day. Mm -hmm. Energizer bunny. Yeah. I'm going to go spend some time out in the sun this afternoon. Physically, are you feeling okay? I mean, are you beat up at all from those 30 yeah, miles? You, you know, out? my feet were definitely a little swollen the day after. For That's a what Lainey days. said too. I recorded <laughs> with him a little while ago. He's like, my ankles and feet were banged up, but that's yeah. Fine. And I didn't notice it during at all. Like there was not any sort of tightness or pain while I was running, but then yeah, the day after my like feet tendons were just really, really mad and everything was a little swollen, but otherwise feel pretty good. Awesome. Well, I do want to talk about your energy levels throughout the weekend, crewing all day on Saturday and then putting together an awesome performance on Sunday to, to win in a crazy fast time. But we'll get to that in a bit before we go into gorge, which will of course take up most of our conversation. I want to kind of talk about this moment in your life and your career, because it's kind of a inflection point. I know you guys have talked about it on trail society, but I'd love to sort of uh, let you kind of talk a little bit about why this is an important moment for you. I know, you know, after many years with Nike, you've now gone on to newer, greener pastures with ultra and in doing so have kind of become a, a pro athlete because of course you were working for Nike before. So maybe before we get into gorge, just talk about what drew you to ultra and what you guys are working on together. Yeah. Well, I guess I never really thought that I could run full time and not have to juggle like a full, a full time job. So I was really excited once I started just talking to other brands who were interested to me that I could maybe do it. And so what drew me to ultra was that they have a lot of very similar goals as me. So the first platform they took when they signed me was on a female runner body and how we need to start like reframing how people look at themselves and how people define success and how they define runners. And if you guys listen to trail society, all that's right up my alley. And so I was super on board with that narrative. Um, and this whole journey has been really fun with them because they just want to know what, what stokes my fire and what kind of things I want to get after from a person perspective, as well as from an athlete perspective. So it's been really cool to work with a brand who, who cares about both facets of your life. Um, and not saying that that was super different with Nike. I always will credit them for a lot of my success and a lot of really awesome experiences running and working for them. Um, but it is really cool to be able to work with a brand who's willing to support you full time for running and also support your dreams as a, as a person too. So it's pretty cool. How has your lifestyle changed? If at all, I mean, you're not the type of person to lay in bed all day as a pro athlete now, or you have probably a little bit more time that you could be spending training or in the gym or whatever, 
What, uh, what maybe benefits have you seen or how has your lifestyle changed with this transition? Yeah. I mean, I've talked about this a lot lately cause I'm not great at not doing much. So I've definitely had to like take some time to reflect internally, um, and try to understand why I feel a little bit of anxiety or stress when I'm not doing anything. And so obviously, even though I do have time to tackle more passions and put more time into other things, and I'm still taking class, like I still have a lot of free time. Um, and so I've been trying to use it to recover. So I have been keeping some of those hours of the day just to do nothing. And like I said, it's kind of weird for me, but like sometimes if I'm tired after a workout where I have to maybe double and lift in the afternoon, I take a nap and I never would have had time for that before. Um, I'm also taking a lot more time to really cook and fuel properly and not just like fuel properly, but be able to cook like real food for lunch, you know? And I know it sounds really silly, but I would never have time to do that before. <laughs> so Go yeah, I mean, I'm definitely on the Nike campus probably. Right, totally. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely adapting, but I do find that you can just channel your energy into training a lot more. And even though it's technically now my full-time job, I find myself being able to leave it with my training and not have it incorporate into all of my day, daily life endeavors, which has been really nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an adjustment to, to not overdo it and not be like, wow, I'm recovering so well because I actually can recover and not overdo it. And so Tyler's been keeping me at bay with that a little bit, um, by making sure I'm not just starting running way too much and, and, and get yeah. myself injured or something because I do have this free time. So yeah, yeah it's well, been a, wanna, an adjustment. I want to talk about Tyler and fueling and all this stuff here as we go into the conversation, because I think both are well worthy of, uh, going in depth on as it pertains to this performance and, what maybe some of the lessons coming out of it are. But before we do, you said on the recent Trail Society too, that with Ultra, I just am interested in hearing more about this interface with a new brand that you guys are working on now, an apparel project together, and that you get to actually be part of that, which I'm sure is really fun as an athlete to contribute in more ways than just throwing a pair of shoes on and winning races like you did at the Gorge. Talk about what you guys are, are working on so far. I know the relationship is still pretty new and fresh, but I think the listeners would be interested, whatever you can share. Yeah. So obviously I can't go into super detail, but, um, I do get to be working alongside the developers as they create the first line of ultra apparel. And so hopefully we'll get to create something that is very versatile, but also extremely functional on the trail. Um, and also looks really good on so that we can, we can have apparel that actually works for us. Um, and, and maybe like start to change some of the narrative around trail running apparel that it has to be this like extremely overbuilt, very technical piece of apparel and, and make it more, no, we can make it extremely comfortable, extremely lightweight and breathable, but also make it very functional for trail running, um, just by doing a couple of things. And so, um, yeah, we're working on some key pieces that hopefully will just be like your everyday running apparel for the next year. And then, yeah, there's more to come in the future. And hopefully just as an athlete, I'll have a lot of insight into that and be able to really create something great with them. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I know. I mean, people who use their footwear, it becomes sort of like part of their identity. People love ultra shoes and to see them sort of making a push into the apparel game, especially with a person like yourself is uh, I think an exciting thing for the market to look out for. And I think it'll be also pretty fun uh, for you as sort of a side project and maybe occupy some of the hours that you're not spending as a researcher anymore. But I'm sure, like I said, you will have no time filling, filling your time with uh, fun activities. But you mentioned Tyler, and obviously I want to talk about the training that led to this amazing performance. Obviously, we're talking about Tyler Green the pride of Portland, Oregon, who also ran the 50 K over the weekend. You guys are both getting ready for Western States in a couple of months. You both smashed the 50 K to pieces. Talk about what you guys have been working on in this coach athlete relationship and maybe how this performance in gorge fits into the greater road towards Western States. Yeah. So one of our biggest focuses over the past, probably couple of months was just keeping consistency in training and then really focusing on like that tempo effort. And so I'd find myself having a lot of 
workouts on my calendar for the week. And I would always be like, Tyler, this is kind of hard. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but he really just wanted me to get comfortable at running faster on trails. And so it was never like the fastest I could run, but it was always this level of tempo that was a harder effort, but, but really let me recover. And so the intervals with that just kept getting longer as we got closer to the race. And so then once we got to this 50 K, um, the goal with this was to really keep it pretty chill for the first half. Um, and then just slowly pick up the pace a little bit as the race progressed, but to finish it, knowing I could have kept going and finish it, knowing I can continue training for Western States. Um, and I think he really was emphasizing a lot of that tempo pace undulation during these long efforts during training. So that when I did that during this race, it didn't feel weird to me. Mm. And so he didn't want me going into the well or going too hard. And so I basically just treated it as I would any of those workouts we'd been working on. Um, with an emphasis on fueling because we have the access to the crew and everything. And so it really felt super manageable, um, which was awesome. And and I had to listen to him in that and actually trust him in how to execute that race um, and not go too hard. And it was awesome. And yeah, I think by training me to be able to continually run at those like tempo efforts, I was able to fuel consistently throughout because I was never going extremely fast or too fast where it would maybe turn my stomach. And so yeah, I was able to nail like all of my nutrition goals as well so that I wasn't leaving the race in a hole of any sort. When you talk about tempo effort, can you be more specific? What types of workouts were you guys doing? How many workouts a week? Things like that. <clears throat> yeah. So I was doing around three workouts a week. Oh, uh, yeah. But again, one of them was a lot smaller. And so those were more like short interval tempo efforts. And so they were a little faster than the longer stuff. And those were more like between tempo and like half marathon pace. And so they were a little bit faster, typically five minutes or under, and they had like a little bit of longer rest. So again, it was really just getting that turnover for a shorter amount of time. But then there was two workouts that would have anywhere from eight minutes to, to longer in a longer run where you were running at this tempo effort with really little rest. So you had to make sure it was actually at tempo, which is it's not going into that lactate threshold or that spot where your, your body starts accumulating the lactate in the muscles and will start to get fatigued. So it's right below that. And so that you can keep that effort up for a longer amount of time. And so those workouts were a lot more work and a really little amount of rest. So for instance, it could be eight by five minutes with only a minute rest in between. It really just feels like a 45 minute tempo, yep. <laughs> you know, like a minute rest. It's, it's hard to even gauge. Um, And so, yeah, there was a lot more of work like that. And then on the weekends, there was always some work thrown into one of the longer runs. Again, not an overwhelming amount of work. And it was always broken up into miles or time intervals that were reasonable with a little bit of rest so that I could get used to just running at those speeds during those longer efforts and not feeling like it took much out of me. This is so cool, man, because you're the fourth champion that I'm recording with today. You're the final one. And I've asked everybody about their training and... I hope the listeners get some entertainment out of the, how different some of the answers are between all of you and what, you know, the, all, all these diverse approaches leading to victories for each of you. So Mm -hmm. anyway, fascinating. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, um, obviously you're in a good place for Western States, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's talk about the race itself. Now in the early miles, you were sort of duking it out with Taylor Nowlin. I was filming you guys on the road section as you approach the Yeon aid station, which is roughly mile 12 and a half. Talk about the early part of the race. Uh, what was kind of your strategy and at what point did you take the lead and establish a gap? Yeah. So the race, for those of you who didn't go or know about the race starts with like a 2000 foot climb up this crazy waterfall and then descends down the backside. And so my goal with that was to just take it out what I felt was a moderately easy pace up the, up the waterfall. Um, and then take it really easy down the backside and, and try to run with girls because one of the biggest things that Tyler wanted me to do for this race. And that one thing I know I need to work on is just feeling like you're in a racing environment because that can feel really intimidating. Like if there are girls in front of you or behind you or right on your shoulder, like that can feel really intimidating and you can start running a race that's not your own. And so I think he really just wanted me to use that first half of the race to feel that um, and to be running with other women and to, to not let that sway my mindset and to sway how I was racing. And so that was kind of the goal for the first half was to, to run with other women, enjoy it, 
um, you know, run hard, but nothing crazy. And to take that backside off of the waterfall really easy because I probably tripped 10 times around there and only knocked my knee once, but that section's gnarly. And you're not going to gain that much time running it faster. You're maybe gain 30 seconds, you know, but if you fall, your get your game's over. So oh. that was kind of the goal for that first half. And then obviously like prioritize fueling as well. And so that at halfway, it doesn't even feel like um, you ran that far already and that you're able to just keep pushing a little bit towards the end. So what point did you establish the gap on the rest of the field? <laughs> um, I think I started pulling away from some of the men and, and Taylor and some of the ladies um, that I was running with around mile 14. Once that, um, that tow path kind of starts going more uphill mm -hmm. and then it does spit you on the trail that goes uphill. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's kind of where a lot of people lost a little bit of their legs or at least compared to where my legs were at. Um, and so from that hill on, I think I looked back and I couldn't see anybody. Um, and then that hill continued and I, I felt pretty good on the climbs. And so I think I, I, I gained a lot of time there. Does your psychology change at that point? Once you look over your shoulder and you don't see anybody, do you step on the gas pedal a little bit more knowing that that's your opportunity or were you just focused on maintaining an even pace? So I think in another racing scenario without the guidance of Tyler, I would have pushed harder, but again, he just kept reiterating to me that this was supposed to be a very like calm race and one where I was supposed to, to go hard, but never to a point where I felt really, really fatigued because that was just not the point of this race. And so while I did see that I was establishing a lead, I did not increase the effort from what I was already going. I just maintained um, the effort that I was doing and, and just kind of continued there. And then when I saw everyone on that out and back section at the PCT, he had told me like, okay, when you get to that last downhill, like you can, you can kind of send it a little bit more, but again, like never run yourself into the ground because we just don't need you to be like needing a ton of time or anything off after this race. So, well, well knowing that that was a sub maximal effort makes it even more impressive because I ran a couple miles with you throughout the day and it was pretty darn impressive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was still obviously hard. Like the ladies who were racing were still throwing down. Like yeah. when I turned around at that turnaround and saw like Leah Yingling only like five or six minutes back, I was like, okay, I can't be a slouch. This is yep. not over, you know? So I still had to push, um, that last part. Like I couldn't lay off the gas. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, you close it out in silly fast time. I think it was four nineteen. I think you were 29 minutes behind the men's winner ninth overall crazy fast. You mentioned in your Instagram post yesterday that fueling was the focus for the race. And I think this is an important thing for you to expand on here in audio form basically summarize what you mentioned in your Instagram mm -hmm. post from yesterday and what the <clears throat> results were, what the learnings were, and maybe how you hope to continue implementing the strategy going forward. Yeah. Well, I've just been talking a lot with my boyfriend lately about fueling strategies for Western States. And whenever he tries to give me advice or critique what I'm saying, I get really defensive. And so we recently had a talk of like, well, why do you feel defensive when you haven't nailed your fueling? <laughs> and it was kind of this aha moment for me. It was like, yeah, I've had good races, but I've never actually nailed my fueling and I've never done it in a good mental state where I've like been proud of it and been very on top of it and, and been okay with the fueling. And so yeah, the goal of this race was to try to just consistently reach the caloric demand that I, that I was setting out for, which for me was 60 grams of carbohydrates an hour or 300 calories, which was about three gels. Um, and so, yeah, when I got across the finish line, like I was telling people that I had 13 gels because I think it's not talked about enough in this sport, but when you're running at those efforts for this long of a duration, the four, four plus hour event, like you need to be fueling your body needs that so that it can continue to push and to reach its potential, but also so that it can recover afterwards. Because if you, if you find yourself, and this is what I've done many years, and this was my biggest goal for this race. If you find yourself with an hour or an hour and a half left and you're like, well, I only have an hour left, so I'm going to eat one gel or maybe nothing because I can make it right. I can get through that hour. Like, yes, you can, we can all get through that hour, but the detrimental effects that has on your muscle recovery later is pretty profound. And so being able to swallow your pride and accept that you might need some gels for that last hour, even if it feels a little bit silly, I think for me was a big turning point in my, my mental strategy with fueling, because it was like, no, this is something that's going to help me. This is my superpower. This is not something to be ashamed of. 
I don't care if you eat 13 gels, you know, nobody's going to take away the crown from you because you fueled more during the race than the person who got second or whatever it is. Right? So <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to reframe people's mind because I think there's a negative stereotype around fueling and there shouldn't be because it's something that's going to let us all reach new levels of potential. And that should be celebrated, not, not frowned upon. Yeah, man. 13 gels. That's a, that's a victory in itself also. And uh, I think you know, our listeners will probably sympathize with, you know, that feeling of, uh, you know, like there's only 20 more minutes left in the race. What is this going to do? But yeah, I've definitely noticed in my career that when you do take that extra gel or just make sure that you take in a little bit more calories that you do not only perform better, but bounce back quicker after those efforts. So, so now looking ahead, Keely, an awesome race to start your season, especially sort of starting this new chapter of your professional life as an athlete looking ahead. Are you still planning to do the Canyons 50 K in a couple of weeks and maybe talk about what the next two and a half months look like before Western States? Yeah. So as of now, obviously I haven't had a recap with my coach yet, but that's the plan as of now is to go race Canyons 50 ish K. It's like a little over 50 K, um, in three weeks and it goes, backwards on the Western States course for about 33 miles. So you gain about 7,000 feet and descend like four or five. Um, but yeah, it runs a lot of the Western States course. So I think it'll be a, again, a great opportunity to focus on fueling in an environment that's going to be very similar to race day. Um, and also get used to, to racing and being comfortable in those a little bit faster speeds. Um, on that course, because I think for me, like course familiarity is, is key, especially for something like Western States. And, Obviously last year I ran it. So I have that a little bit of course familiarity, but whoever's ran a 100, you can probably resonate with the fact that you probably go through a lot of amnesia and don't really remember a lot of the course. (laughs) Um, And so I don't really know the course that well. Um, And so I'm actually also going to be spending like two weeks uh, in Tahoe city doing a lot of course recon with some friends um, basically throughout the middle of May. Um, and so hopefully that'll be a good training block to kind of close out the biggest training block after canyons, um, and really just get a lot of miles on the course, um, familiarize yourself with those climbs, get a lot of descending on the body so that you get a little bit accustomed to that. Um, and then just really dial in your, um, cooling and fueling strategies for those kind of hot trails. One thing that's just popping into my head that I think is maybe interesting is, that would be two fifty Ks leading into Western States. Is there anything else that you would do in between canyons and the race? And is there any conversation that you and Tyler have had? Cause he's kind of done the same thing, right? He's done mm-hmm. three fifty Ks to start his season. And I don't know if he's planning to do anything between Gorge and Western States. Have you guys talked about, you know, doing the 50 Ks in the lead up or like, do you feel any pressure to jump into a 50 miler or a hundred K? So I'd say the old Keely would have signed up for Canyons 100 K. Um, but I I've had conversations with Tyler and I've had conversations with myself around what's going to be the most advantageous for me and with the least risk. And I think running canyons 100 K would give you a lot of confidence at that longer distance. But I think the risk is not, is not worth it for me because I have had some ankle injuries and some injuries in the past. And I just don't, I don't need to take the risk that hundred K does weigh on you because hundred K is really long. <laughs> and the, the risk that you don't recover properly from that, or you tweak something during it is just too high for me to be okay with. And so Um, that kind of played a lot of the role in picking 50 Ks. Um, and I think another thing that I've, I've grappled with is just knowing myself and I like to race and I like to move fast. And I think you can race 50 Ks relatively hard and recover. And I don't think you can race hundred Ks pretty hard and recover quite as easily. And so Mm -hmm. I think just knowing myself, that's kind of why I chose the 50 K route. Um, and then Tyler was on board because again, he knows my history with some injuries and, he thinks that they were perfectly like situated for a build. And, and that doesn't mean we're not going to run longer runs on the course when we have that two week block, um, or at least back to back long runs, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not going to be a 100 kilometers on the course. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's a delicate balance, isn't it? To get the strength necessary to carry you hundred miles, but also arrive at the start line with the freshness knowing and wanting to put yourself through that. Exactly. I think it's a a wise strategy that both you guys are taking and 
hopefully it'll pay off for both of you. Well, Keely, thank you so much for coming to Gorge and starting your season with us. It was so great and so inspiring to see your performance. Thanks for coming on the show and talking a little bit about it. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. That was one of the best weekends of the 2022 year so far. Oh, we so didn't thank talk you. About, we got to talk about, you also crewed for Ellie Pell on Saturday, <laughs> so which made it even more impressive. Yeah. So how, did you, how did you manage to pull off that double? That was like a full <laughs> training day in itself. Well, I think when you crew for other people racing and you get to be in that environment, you pick up on all of the stoke. And so you're not feeling stressed. You're, you have all of the energy from everyone around you. That is so loving. You're watching people push themselves. And so, I mean, it is extra time on feed. It is a lot of running around feeling a little stressed because you haven't seen your friend yet or because I had a lot of friends running too. Um, but I think at the end of the day, with it being an early season race, there wasn't a ton of stress around the race. Um, I wasn't too concerned about it. And I think putting concern in it would have made myself feel worse. Right. So like just putting it out of mind, being like, no, that was a soul filling day. You know, it might've been a little bit more time on my feet than I should have done. But at the end of the day, like you don't lose your fitness from that day. As long as you're just like trying to sleep and recover and like fuel during the race. Like, I think you'll be okay. So (laughs) just trying not to put pressure on it. (laughs) A 10 hour crewing day followed by a four hour 50 K the next day. What a weekend. Well, Keely, again, thanks for coming on the show. Enjoy some recovery and uh, we'll catch you soon. Thanks. I will.